Uh, my name is Tony Salerno. My, my usual role, and I work with the National Council, is to um, sort of introduce the TED, TED Talkers, and I had mentioned Joe Parks would not be able to, to make it as the, as the um, first speaker. Uh, so you got me instead, okay? And uh, <laughs> so I'll, I'll do my, my best to kind of resurrect <laughs> a topic that I had discussed earlier. Um, and, and, and this is, let me first give you a little bit of my, my background. I retired from the Office of uh, Mental Health in New York State, and I was just involved in like, running a lot of outpatient programs and worked inpatient for a, for a long time. I was a high school teacher before I became a psychologist. Uh, and the last number of years with the Office of Mental Health, I was the director of evidence-based practice initiatives. And my job was to go around the state of New York and raise the awareness of provided communities about what, what do we mean by evidence-based practices and why is it so important? And then really the critical question is how in God's name do you ever help organizations to begin to adopt and implement evidence-based practices? But through that whole process, I kind of came to a few, few insights, right? What well, I think they're insights and some ideas that I, I think is worth sharing because I thoroughly, uh, thoroughly embrace the importance of taking research and the evidence and having that guide our decisions around treatments and services. And the clients that we serve deserve that. But this whole issue of make sure you stay faithful to the evidence-based practice seems to be a very critical principle. And I want to challenge it just a little bit, just a little bit, to stretch our brains around this. Because for many organizations, trying to keep faithful, right, was quite a challenge. And does that mean you just sort of like dump the whole thing because you can't you can't implement at a very high level of fidelity. So that's the topic, right? Is it really a sin to be unfaithful? And as a recovering Catholic, that's an important issue for me as well. <laughs> okay, so here's the problem, right? Is there's, you have the evidence-based practices, they're usually done in like a kind of a lab controlled setting, and then you got the provider kind of realities, which isn't so well controlled, right? And it says, well, how, do, how can we make these things, uh, you know, come together and address this gap? And so the really big challenge is how to make this all happen. So uh, what I'm going to say is that evidence-based practice in of itself, the, uh, what the research tells us, it really isn't the whole picture at all. It does, it's not the same as the best practice. And, and I think what the Institute of Medicine, one of their definitions around uh, best practices and quality practice is more than just what the evidence is. As it turns out, you know what seems to be pretty important? Like the practitioner's experience and their knowledge and skills. What do you think? It's kind of like important, right, to be able to engage clients, right, to be able to deal with many challenges that come up. So those interpersonal engaging motivation sorts of skills are not inconsequential. They're core to the work. But then there's even something even more important. Apparently, the client's perspective seems to be important too, <laughs> right, of whether it, what you're providing really aligns with what is a felt need. So when we really think about it, the notion of a real quality practice needs to take into account the evidence, but also the practitioner's core competencies and particularly around engagement and relationship building as well as the consumer's perspective and when they line up you got you got a, a best a best practice make sense okay so uh, the reason why i'm saying this is the the idea of the consumer perspective all of the research the billions of dollars that have gone into medications all the training that folks have had psychiatrists and psychologists and social workers all the money goes into the buildings that we create right to provide services. They pretty much come down to very little if the client gives you one of these. You, anybody from New York? All right, so from New York, you know what that, that's all about. But really, when you think about it, all it takes is a client going like this, and all those billions of dollars of medication and research and all the training you have has been reduced to kind of hardly anything. So I think that that's an important consideration in how we, we look at quality uh, practices. Uh, you ever feel this way? Okay, be, again, because all of the, the hard work and all of the investments of many billions of dollars uh, still keep us with a headache if we're not able to engage a client and involve a client in their care as full partners. So the developers, however, of evidence-based practices, and I was very much involved in the work you know, at Dartmouth when SAMHSA was trying to promote, you know, when that port study came out and said, hey, uh, as, as it turns out, there's a bunch of good practices ought to be available to folks. And then they took the next step and went into organizations and said, well, uh, I'm sure folks are reading the research on weekends and then bringing it back and trying to implement that. And what they went out and said, well, this is really something, isn't it? All of the work and research that's going on is over here. And then what providers are doing is like over here. And that's like, how do we, how do we bring this? How does that happen? That research seems to have so little influence 
right, an impact on the actual services and practices. Well, the developer's perspective, of course, is that the practice that he or she or team develops feels at times that it was kind of came from God. <laughs> that is really important, right? So you have multiple family group, uh, in, uh, IDD teachers, are just examples, support and employment, all these things, very, very good things. But the developer's perspective is that this is really, really good stuff and you ought not to mess with it and just implement it as you're expected to. You follow the rules, right? Make sure that you follow the rules and don't cheat. Don't fool around with the thing. Don't mess with the practice. Don't add your own stuff and don't take stuff out. It's like you're not gonna be able to bake the cake if you don't add the eggs in and you don't add in the milk. And so the idea of just treat the baby, because whenever you develop something, you're so connected to it, right? It's like your baby. And you know what your baby looks like to you as a developer of a practice? This is what the baby looks like, <laughs> right? Now, when the practice goes to the provider community, they may not see it the same way. In fact, they might see it a little bit like this, <laughs> right? So it's kind of important <laughs> to recognize that you're perceiving the lens is a little bit different, okay? So then, uh, what's, the, so what's the problem? Why is it that organizations seem to have a real big problem trying to both adopt, implement, and nearly really sustain practices at a high level of, well, whose fault is it? And I've actually read some, some articles where the fault really lied in the provider. The leadership, the leadership wasn't you know, behind it enough, the staff were resistant about the thing, the, maybe you, bet you can blame the, uh, the, the finance system, isn't really like supporting it, but somehow there really wasn't a looking deeply at the practice itself were there characteristics of the practice that just made it very difficult for organizations to have uh, you know, uptake. And so whose fault really does it come down to? Who's the sinner? Who's the one who has been unfaithful? Who's sinning here? That we say, look, and the, th and the goal is you gotta keep working hard so that you can ensure that you maintain fidelity to the practice. So let's play a little bit what I call the uptakeability kind of game. Because there are characteristics of practices that supports and promotes uptake, and there are characteristics of practices that make it pretty hard, right? So let me ask you this. I need thumbs up or thumbs down from you guys? Yeah, okay. This is, a, I'm just, this is an instruction about the thumbs up or the thumbs down. Okay, so uh, if it's very sensitive to staff turnover, if the practice is very sensitive to staff turnover, plus or minus, down. I said, well, you know, and that doesn't mean you throw out a practice, you don't go forward, but you have to know what challenges you're going to encounter. They say, if it's really sensitive, now there are some practices really sensitive. You know, I was working in New York State, I was really advancing many of these evidence-based practices for adults. So just an example, take multiple family, multiple family groups. You may have two people, you know, Mary and Joe, really committed to this practice. They start seeing clients and, and their families at night you know, for like an hour and a half, and then they get very close, they, they get engaged, they get married, they go off to uh, Arizona and raise a family. And what happens to that practice? It kind of like, oh yeah, we used to do that. But Joe and Mary, you know, they were really behind it. But you know, they got together, now they're raising kids in Arizona, and what are you gonna do? There's one practice you'll never hear that from, and that's medication. I've never heard anyone say, oh, we used to have that medication stuff. But uh, you know, the psychiatrist left, you know, a couple of weeks ago, what are you gonna do? Uh, we'd like to get back to it one of these days. So it seems like certain things stick, no matter what, and other things can be very sensitive to turn off. The champion is not there, it disappears. That's not a good system, is it? You wouldn't have like, a specialist in diabetes, and then, oh, you know, he or she left, you say, well, we'd like to get back to that stuff, but, uh, you know, what can you do? The person left. So it's important to think about any kind of practice where it relies very much on the energy of specific champions. How about if it takes a long time to implement it? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs down, because the longer it takes to implement it, like, <sighs> there's so many other things that will kind of likely come up that will detract you from actually being able to implement it. So some, some practices are, take a long time and others are short. So if it's shorter, you're more likely to have uptakes. So what I'm really doing here is trying to diagnose the characteristics of a practice that are likely to affect its uptake. Now, how about if it's just adding like another demand on the staff? And you just say, oh, 
another thing I got to do. You ever feel like that? You think any staff ever feel this way? So I said, oh, really, I wasn't sitting around kind of saying to myself, gee, I wish somebody would come by and give me something to do because I'm so bored. <laughs> you know, that's usually, so looking at the demand on staff, both in terms of their training and skill, as well as demand on time and energy. How about if, oh, just add another form, just one little, <laughs> one little form, just one, just one, come on, just one little form. I don't think I remember New York State where we ever added a form and took another form out. I just can't remember. I just don't remember that ever happening, right? So if it requires like more paperwork, then it's kind of like, oh. Again, another issue uh, related to, to uptake. How about if you can't get paid for it, right? Or it's kind of difficult. You have to figure out how we're going to get paid for this thing. And is it going to really make fiscal sense? So that's another important characteristic of a practice. So what's going to be the solution you know, to all of this? Because I really am, and as the director of evidence-based practices, I was thoroughly committed to improving the standards of practice that we have out, particularly for pe adults with serious um, me mental illness. So the solution or problem, what are we going to do? So what's needed? So the idea of organizations typically say, you know, Tony, we can kind of do this aspect of the practice, but this other one is like, it's going to be really tough for us. Should we, should we just kind of forget it? Or should we kind of move forward? And that's really the kinds of decisions that providers need to make like all the time, right? If we can't do it all, does it mean we don't do any of it? And I think that is an important issue. And then also they have to take a look, as I, as I mentioned in what a really best practice is, what about the client's felt need? Does it align with this particular practice? Or do we find ourselves having to try to convince, control, uh, uh, con you know, <laughs> establish incentives, contingencies for folks to really go in? And so that's like an, another issue. And then what about our workforce here? In what way does it really align with their current skills and how much more would they need to learn in order to move it? So the idea of, of, of so I think one idea is really start with the key players to begin to take a look at whatever the practice you know, might be and their experience, their perspective. If staff or others feel like this is something we're inflicting on you and we're gonna get you to do this whether you like it or not, it, the chances of it actually being presented in a way that's going to be useful is gonna be reduced. The other is, there's sort of maybe another approach to some of these things. So one approach is a model approach, right? You have a model, it has all of these sorts of ingredients to it. The other approach is, hmm, let's take a look at a lot of the different models and perhaps there are some common elements across these various models that we can extract and the active ingredient of the practice are, is actually those common elements. And there are so, some folks who are working on that. If folks have ever heard of Bruce Trapita and some of the work out in, uh, in UCLA, what they basically did is they took all the research, let's say for depression for adolescents, right? And there's like, you know, there's, believe it or not, there's like a lot of models out there. So they took a look at all the models, all the research, and what they did is they extracted from those what were the common elements across those models, right? So you don't actually say we're using this model versus that model. What we're using are those core elements that have been found in, an, in a lot of the research out there. Does that make sense as, as a way, one way to go? That is one way to go. And so uh, the other is, if you're going to adapt something, that you have a responsibility. You just can't willy-nilly sort of change stuff, right? That doesn't make any sense either. And so the notion is if you make some adaptations, here's an opportunity for the field to actually contribute to science, to kind of take a look at the outcomes. If you made these sort of changes. We worked on a project with m uh, multiple family groups for Chinese, Latino, and African-American families in New York City. Uh, we, believe it or not, we had to make really serious, the organization had to make some serious adaptations because of the experience that we got from and the insight and feedback we got from family members, from the clients themselves, from uh, experts in that uh, cultural area. And you know, how do we begin to shape it? But if you just say we just made changes to it without looking at the outcomes, then we're really not contributing very much to the field. And that's really where the practice to science comes in. And there's great opportunities out there because many organizations really struggle with can we apply this practice in the same way that it was applied in a lab setting, which for a lot of organizations, they're not labs. Right? They can't control like who comes and who goes. They don't, oh, we can't you, you know, offer this to you because you have this, this, and this kind of uh, diagnosis right? that, wasn't, that was sort of excluded in the, in the original lab work. So th I think this is an important issue for us to, to kind of think about as well. But the really new approach entirely, which, what I'd like to just leave you with, 
is this notion of we have evidence-based practices, but I'm more convinced than ever that what we really need is the evidence-based practitioner, <coughs> that we have to focus on what those core skills are for, for helpers. And if they have that at a very high level, the evidence-based practices, I think, is like a hop, skip, and a jump away. And the way I'd like to just kind of leave with a story of one of my colleagues, Dr. Margulies, who I spent many years working with, and he recounts to me a story of working with a client for a couple of years out in Nassau County in Long Island. And he said he worked with this young man for a couple of years. And Paul was very familiar with the evidence-based practice. So he did family psychoeducation work. He did social skills, you know, work with the person. He had this whole plan around symptom management uh, for this particular client. Um, so he, he, he did, you know, as much as he could to bring these evidence-based practices. But at the end of the two years, this young man did really, really well, did really well. And Paul, uh, Paul as most graduate students and students in training might, might do, they say, well, listen, we've been together two years. We had your family come in. We did a lot of the, you know, work educating your family. We did all that social skills, you know, training. You learned a little bit about mental health and how to manage some of those symptoms. We did relaxation training, all this kind of stuff. Just what was it? that really mattered to you out of all the things we did in the last two years? Because you really have done very well. He says, oh, I know. Oh, okay, great. So what was it? He says, every time you came to the waiting room, you shook my hand. And that, I think, is a very powerful message, right? Because what was he saying with that is, you showed me respect. You showed that you cared about me. You treated me like a, a person. And that was the context in which I was able to recover. I think it's important never to forget that. And that's really what the evidence-based practitioner is all about. So if we can combine that with really good quality services, where we can bring the research, combine it with the client's perspective and their felt need, as well as our commitment and confidence of establishing a relationship, I think we've got something pretty powerful. And I think that's an idea worth spreading. Thanks very much, folks. Anybody from the National Council here? Uh, one of the staff? Yeah, can you just get a, a, a glass of water or a bottle of water? Thanks. Okay, it's really my pleasure now to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Fred uh, Osher. Let me just tell you a little bit about, about Fred. Over the past three decades, Dr. Osher has led a lot of initiatives really related to the, the folks that we serve really who have been incarcerated, homeless individuals with serious behavioral problems in the public sector, local, state, and federal levels. And he's extensive experience with the development, delivery, evaluation, and adaptation of interdisciplinary treatment programs within service and research settings really around the country. So his previous position include Director of Center for Behavioral Health Justice and Public Policy, Director of Community Psychiatry at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, uh, also Director of Division of Demonstration Programs at CMHS and SAMHSA, and Deputy Director of the Office of Programs for the Homeless Mentally Ill at NIMH. In his current position, he's the Director of Health Systems and Health Services Policy at the Council of State Government Justice Center and oversees the health components of the center's initiatives. So he provides a lot of technical assistance to state and local governments really across the country that seek to improve their responses to people who have mental health and substance use disorders and also involved in a criminal justice system. So Dr. Osher has published really extensively in many of these areas. Uh, and I want you to just join me in welcoming Dr. Osher. Thank you so much, Tony. And I mean, to give a TED Talk with a couple hours notice, how good is he, you know? <laughs> Always a tough act to follow. Thank you so much for uh, taking time out of this uh, really packed agenda to sit in a room and hear about a topic that many of you may not have a lot of experience with. And that was the point of uh, making this title, What You Don't Know Can Hurt Them, Identifying and Treating criminogenic behavior. I want to start with a vignette. And uh, our committee at the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry had a connection with Dear Abby, and we asked her to post a note in one of her columns asking her readers if you or your loved one has had experience with the criminal justice system and they or you have a mental illness, could you tell us a little bit about that? 
And within two months, we got 3,000 letters, each of which poignant, heartfelt, cries for help. And I want to share one of those letters with you now. It's one mother's submission. My daughter was diagnosed with bipolar disorder was Helen, when Helen was in her late 20s. She has been arrested many times before. Her crimes? Impulsivity, manic behavior, and grossly poor judgment in her choice of friends. At no time did she hurt anyone, steal an identity, drink and drive, become involved in the manufacture and sale of illegal drugs, or commit any other serious crime for which individuals are usually arrested. She did, however, seek out the company of those who did engage in such dubious activities, and because of her trusting manner and admittedly often odd behavior, she was an easy mark for those looking to take advantage of the weak. Upon learning of her latest arrest, I immediately called jail personnel to notify them that Helen was bipolar, needed medication, and offered to bring medication to the jail. I was informed that bringing drugs for the, any purpose to the jail was forbidden, but I had no reason to, I was assured no reason to concern because those that need medication receive them. The fact is that in the five days my daughter was incarcerated, before we could raise the required bail, she didn't receive a single dose of medication. She was not held in a specialized mental health unit. Not only was she denied medication, but because jail cells were overcrowded, there were not enough cots for everyone, and she was forced to sleep on the floor of the cell with a thin blanket for cover. These jail episodes have been devastating experiences, not only for my daughter, who had to endure them, but for her entire family. While wading through one court hearing after another, she has been forced to cope with anxiety in the highest degree, followed by days of incapacitating depression and the ever-present threat of doing real jail time. At the same time, family members have been financially, personally, and emotionally traumatized. And for what reason? My daughter suffers from bipolar depression and, as a result, exercises poor judgment and has the uncanny ability to be with the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people. After almost two years of court hearings and thousands of dollars paid to lawyers and other fees, her case was dismissed when it was eventually proven that two of her neighbors had hidden drugs in her apartment before anonymously calling the police. Within hours of her arrest, her friends had burglarized and trashed her entire apartment, stealing, among other things, a new computer, a stereo set, while killing her pet in the process. Over 1.5 million people with serious mental illness will be arrested this year. Over 50 people during the course of this TED Talk will be put in handcuffs, taken to a sally port, booked into jail, and put in a holding cell. It is 10 times more likely that a person with serious mental illness ends up in a jail than in a hospital at this point in time. In a study that we did several years ago in three jails in New York and a couple in Maryland, 17% of the individuals booked into those facilities met our conservative criteria for a serious mental illness. That represented 14.5% of the men and 31%, a stunning 31% of women booked into those facilities had a serious mental illness. Four to eight times the rates of the general population. What's that about? Well, what, what accounts for that? Well, it's not because they're more violent. We, we know the myths surrounding that issue. Co-occurring substance use disorders, absolutely. Of those individuals I mentioned, three quarters of them met criteria for a co-occurring substance use disorder. And with our war on drugs and street sweeps and increasing arrests for possession sales and trafficking, we bring in a lot of individuals with mental illness. It is also the case that not having a house makes you vulnerable to arrest. And we have an affordable housing crisis in this country. Boy, it's a, not a crisis, anymore. it's just a chronic condition that we face in all of our communities, right? And so out on the street, you know, visible, exposed to the elements, oftentimes picked up for crimes of survival, homelessness is a factor that helps explain high rates. In our homeless population, about a quarter have serious mental illnesses. Lack of access to care, a factor. And we can celebrate the 9.3 million individuals that have now got insurance as a result of the Affordable Care Act, but there's several million, dozen million more that don't. And not having access to treatment and care is a significant barrier to moving forward with your recovery. It is also the case, and a nice segue from the last presentation, when you go into a health facility, a community mental health center, you don't always get the evidence-based practices that the science says are effective for achieving the outcomes that we care about. And maybe they're not 
delivered with fidelity. Also a point that Tony had made quite well. It is the case that when you get into jail, regardless of the pathway, if you have a mental illness, you get stuck there. Okay? Longer times in jail and prison at pretrial and sentence status if you have a mental illness compared to folks without mental illness controlled for charge, age, and demographics. You just get stuck. You can't post the bond. You end up spending long periods of time, twice as long in some instances as people without mental illness, in a pretrial status where there's a presumption of innocence. But there you are on the floor with a thin blanket for cover. Okay? It is the case that when you are released and you have a serious mental illness, you come back more often. You're part of a revolving door. You have higher recidivism rates. And lastly, and this is the theme of this presentation, you end up in jail for the same reasons that people without mental illness end up in jail. And these are what we call criminogenic risks. And people with mental illnesses have as much or more of these risk factors than people without, and I'm going to discuss that with you now. What are criminogenic risks? First of all, it's not my term. I didn't make it up. No one asked me to vote on it. I don't like it. It's pejorative. I get it, all right? But it happens to be the criminal justice parlance that has been used for the last several decades. And so we need to understand it and understand its application to individuals with mental illness. And if you don't know or haven't heard the term, don't feel so bad. It's not in Wikipedia. It's not in Webster's. It's new. And it's something that we're trying to understand and catch up with at this point in time. What is criminogenic risk? It is how likely a person is to commit a new crime or violate the conditions of release that land them back in jail. That's what criminogenic risk is. It's not about dangerousness. It's not about violence. It's not about failure to appear. It's a predictive model for whether that individual in the community is going to stay or return to custody. The degree of an individual's criminogenic risk is a measurable phenomena. And we are now in our fourth generation of screening and assessment tools for this measure. The tools comprised of two basic components static factors and dynamic factors. Static factors can't do anything about it. They include criminal history, number of arrests, number of conviction, current charges, age at first arrest, the younger you start in a criminal path, the more likely you're to continue. Current age, young people more risky than old people, gender, males more risky than females. Those are the static factors. But that's not why I'm talking to this audience. It's the dynamic factors that we need to understand. And that it has been the course of research over the last several decades that has distilled these factors into eight principal reasons why people get in trouble. They're the central eight risk factors. And let me read them to you. History of antisocial behavior, antisocial personality pattern, antisocial cognition, antisocial attitudes, or antisocial associates, family or marital problems, school or work performance difficulties, few leisure or recreational activities, and substance use disorders. You didn't hear mental illness on that list. It isn't an explanatory factor for much of the two million people with mental illness that will get arrested. So what are criminogenic needs then? Each of these dynamic risk factors, changeable, we can do something about them, have an associated need. And that if those are addressed adequately, it mitigates the likelihood of a person being arrested again. These central eight risk factors are the explanatory factors for much of the behavior that gets people in trouble. And the dynamic risk factors require interventions, treatment for substance use disorders, developing meaningful daytime activity, having pro-social associates, okay, dealing with family and marital discord. That's the bread and butter of what we do in behavioral health. If you come into my mental health center, I'm going to do an assessment, problems with marriage, problems with work, problems with substance use. We'll develop a plan around it. It's the big four, the top ones, the antisocial personality patterns, 
the history of antisocial behavior, antisocial cognitions, antisocial associates, those are the ones that historically we haven't done a very good job of addressing. When I was in training a minute or two ago, I was told that many of these features were part of personality disorders and personality disorders were egocentric, and we couldn't do anything about it. How convenient, right? <laughs> Let's put it on access to and not serve the individual. That's not a very effective strategy and we know now that these factors aren't states. They aren't traits. They're states that can be modified. Okay? So, what I want to do uh, with those is a call to action for all of you that are out here. We got to get better. We got to help. We have to understand these and address them. They require specific interventions to help people make better decisions. Now, you need to understand where these fit in our criminal justice schemata. The RNR model is a driving factor in the adjudication, sentencing, and supervision of individuals in our community. R and R. It's not rest and relaxation. It's an R, it's an N, it's an R, okay? The first R is risk. And with this, the principle is focus on the higher risk individuals. So we have very scarce resources in our community. If recidivism reduction is the goal, counties are spending enormous amounts of money on the jail and court systems that exist. It's their highest budget cost. Well, how do we drive down recidivism? Focus on individuals that are more likely to come back than otherwise. Lower risk individuals with high needs, link them to care. They need that treatment. But we need other strategies to address and help those individuals with higher risk. The N in R&R, target the criminogenic needs. All right? Target the factors that get people in trouble. It's important that we know what they are, and the more of them that we can be helpful with, the less likely that person is to get arrested going forward. Okay? And then the last R in R&R, &R, responsivity. Another made up word, you won't find it in the dictionary, but it relates to an acknowledgement, as our previous presenter described, people are very different in their culture, in gender, in a variety of factors, and those factors need to be incorporated in the delivery of interventions so that the person can take them up and use them and apply them. This is where mental illness comes in. It's a responsivity factor, all right? So that if I am at home and I haven't slept and I'm not eating and I've lost weight, I'm despondent, I'm hopeless, I'm thinking of suicide, how good of a group participant am I going to be tomorrow in that thinking for a change group? I'm not even going to get there, right? I'm not going. I'm apathetic. I have a major depressive disorder. I need treatment for that. That's the responsivity part of that. And that treatment is absolutely necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. The ineffectiveness of treatment programs to reduce recidivism among individuals with serious mental illness is, can be traced directly to neglecting or not adhering to the R&R &R principles. So why should we care? I think many of you already do and you're here about that. As providers, we're in the business of helping people achieve their goals and objectives. And so many of the people seeking care from us at our facilities have a history of criminal justice involvement. Forty percent of individuals with serious mental illness will have contact with law enforcement at some point during their lives. Forty percent. I work in a homeless shelter in South Carolina. Nine out of ten people that come to me have had contact with law enforcement, been arrested, and spent time in jail. No, none of them want to go back. It's their goal to stay out of jail and prison. And they come to us for help and support. The other reason we should care, the criminal justice system and the people it serves are part of our community. Law enforcement, courts, jails, prisons, community corrections personnel, they're our colleagues. They're in our community. They're our customers and they need our help. They're frustrated by that revolving door scenario that I described. The judges ask, can't you do something to change the behavior of this person so I don't deal with them again? A fair question is posed to us. And all of us want to live in safe communities. All of us want our clients to live in safe communities. Public safety is a part of our mission and we need to engage our criminal justice partners in that mission. And lastly, why we should be uh, concerned about this, we can be of help. We have something to offer. Criminal behavior is too serious to be left in the hands 
of justice and correctional professionals who rely principally on segregation and punishment of wrongdoers. That's not the people that should be behavioral change experts. That's our forte. That's why we got trained and we went to school. There are cognitive behavioral interventions similar to what we employ in the treatment of depression that are validated, effective, evidence-based, and can be delivered if we have the skills and training to do so. They're manualized. They take the form of thinking for a change or moral recognition therapy or reasoning and rehabilitation. They're out there. They've been developed by our criminal justice community and are principally delivered by our criminal justice partners. That's a little twisted. Okay? We ought to be that behavioral change agent and providing those effective interventions. What we don't know can hurt us too. Too often, stigma gets in the way of our responses. Just as the general public may not be comfortable with people with mental illness, so too our clinicians may not be comfortable with criminals. The criminals comes in all sizes and shapes, and criminals are seeking our help. And I'm using that term purposefully, not to be pejorative, but to broadly suggest they already are coming in. And to the extent we can recognize the risks that they pose and respond, we're all safer for that. So where do we go from here? Let's learn the language so we can be a good partner. The solutions to overrepresentation of people with mental illness in the criminal justice system requires a village. It's a partnership that needs to be established. We need to participate in the training of law enforcement, as many of you do, in the development of crisis intervention teams. We have to support our judicial processes, specialty courts, and general jurisdiction courts, so there are alternatives to incarceration. We must develop a robust crisis service system. There need to be alternatives. That law enforcement officer will drop that person off at the ER or your crisis center if they can get back on the street in a quick way, avoiding an unnecessary booking. We need to take a good psychosocial history. Too often we don't ask about arrest, conviction, jail days, warrants. And without understanding that, we may not have an opportunity to provide effective intervention. For those with criminal justice histories, and not all do, 40% maybe in the population dealing with, but those with criminal justice histories, we need to understand what their level of risk might be. And there are screening tools that are available for us to assess that with. We also, for those that then are identified with moderate and high risk, we need to incorporate the needs associated with those risks into your treatment plans, and then with those treatment plans, deliver the goods, deliver those evidence-based interventions that mitigate the risk of that individual being arrested again. And lastly, we need to measure the success and outcomes. I'm a proponent of having us accountable for arrests and jail days and jail days homelessness with the population we work with. Can we control all the factors that are going into those events? No, but we can control some of them with the people that come for our help. So, in conclusion, there are just too many Helens out there and too many families of Helens out there for us to ignore. We have substituted punishment for treatment for far too many for far too long and this American tragedy must end. Its time is now to end it. There are too many instances in the, which we don't know what's going on with an individual and not knowing that can hurt them, can keep them from achieving their goals and recovery. And let me end this presentation by stating that I'm well aware that reducing rich, complex human beings to a couple of dimensions is absurd, all right? And that while I'm advocating for a new set of skills and a new set of interventions, at the core of everything we do is a caring and respectful relationship. That's where it matters. Francis Peabody, in an address to a medical graduating class in 1925, said, one of the essential qualities of the clinician is interest in humanity, for the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. It's about the relationship. And I know you're at this conference as leaders and providers in your community because you care, and I thank you for that.
Terrific. Yeah, just the clicker. Just use the right, the right, right one. Advances word. it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hey, uh, I want to introduce our third speaker, Mark Ishog, who is the chief executive officer of Thresholds. He's one of Illinois' uh, oldest and largest providers of healthcare services for persons with severe mental illness. Um, Mark Ishog, uh, through its, his leadership, really at Thresholds, is le many innovative <coughs> programs that improve health outcomes and reduce costs, including a program with Illicare that in just one year created 50% overall reduction in behavioral health admissions and a 63% reduction in overall costs for inpatient care among the highest cost Medicaid behavioral health clients. He's previously served as the president and CEO of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago, where he grew the agency significantly as he has at Thresholds more than doubling its budget and staff. He also served as the CEO of AIDS United, a national AIDS advocacy organization. Please join me in welcoming Mark Ishok. Okay. Right. Oops. Uh, thank you, Tony, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you've seen all five TED Talks that preceded this one, but they were amazing, and they're by doctors and PhDs, and Billy Crystal, or uh, Tony Salerno, so. Uh, and you can, uh, and you know what all these topics were about, and then this is what I'm gonna do in just a few minutes. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how this fits, but I will try to explain. Um, so again, my name is Marcus Shug, and I'm the CEO of Thresholds. Thresholds has been around for about 55 years, and we provide home, health, and hope to those with the most serious and persistent mental illness. One of my favorite acronyms is REACH, and we help people at Thresholds reach for recovery through research, employment, advocacy, care, and housing, and those together spell REACH. We help people reach for recovery to achieve their dreams and to, uh, to live the life that they deserve to live. Um, so I know in doing this TED-like or TED-ish talk uh, that I'm supposed to talk about my passions and how it relates to the work that we do. And um, I asked Linda Rosenberg, our illustrious CEO, if I could talk about Sharpays, female folk singers, or cleaning supplies. <laughs> so I can explain to you all afterwards like why I would do that. But Linda, in her inimitable New York Bronx accent, said, I don't think so. <laughs> she said, you can talk about almost anything else, but not that. And how about talking about supported employment, housing, research, MCOs, insurance? And I said in my South Side Chicago accent, I don't think so. I'm not doing that. There are 4,000 people here over the le next three days that are talking about those things. Uh, so we compromised, and that's when we agreed. She agreed that I could talk about giraffes. So for the next 12 or 13 minutes, I will tell you uh, why. About a year ago, I was asked to serve on a panel in Chicago at the Donors Forum, and the topic was private philanthropy. It was celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Donors Forum, and the keynote speaker was a guy named Sterling Spurn, the CEO of the Kellogg Foundation, a really fabulous foundation. And uh, so into this audience, mostly of uh, philanthropists and foundation folks, he, um, he quoted another observer of American philanthropy, a guy named Valdemar Nielsen, who said that private foundations like giraffes should not exist at all. They do, but they shouldn't exist at all. And then he went on to say, that's because private foundations, are there any private foundations in the room? I should be careful here. Uh, but this is, these are his words, not mine. That private foundations are like giraffes because they always seem to be looking down at you. They always act as if they're sticking their necks out for you. And they could not be more prepared to work at the grassroots level. Uh, so I didn't care that he was criticizing 400 philanthropists in the room, but, um, but I was not happy because um, I love giraffes. What he did not know is that I was on this panel about to respond to him, and I lived in Kenya, Zimbabwe, and Mozambique for many years and worked there and surrounded by giraffes and absolutely loved them and just think they're the most fabulous creature uh, in the world. And um, so I didn't get mad at him. I had to respond to him, but I just I had a brainstorm on that panel. Um, everybody 
everybody has a mascot, right? Schools have them, the Florida Gators, the Marquette Mustangs. Uh, every sports team seems to have one, the Chicago Bears, the Baltimore Ravens. Cereals have animal mascots. Tony the Tiger to Can Sam. I mean, even insurance companies have an animal mascot, right? A lizard or a gecko or a geico. Uh, that's Warren Buffett's company, so we're going to be very nice uh, about, uh, about the geico. Uh, but that's when I, um, you know, and that's when I decided sort of right then and there that we, the behavioral health world, needed a mascot. Um, they, and, and I will give you, in David Letterman fashion, uh, my top ten reasons why we should adopt, we collectively, should adopt the giraffe as our mascot. I know TED Talks, you're supposed to do three things and all that, but I'm, gonna have, I'm a kid of David Letterman. I'm going to give you the top ten reasons. Number ten, giraffes like us are super fast. We go from emergency to emergency in the blink of an eye. We help people find housing on a moment's notice. We write grant applications, successful ones, over a weekend. And we help a client in crisis. So I know I'm not supposed to talk about female folk singers, but Mary Chapin Carpenter is my favorite female folk singer. <laughs> I so love her. Uh, and if she were here, she would sing. I don't sing. But she would sing. In this world, there's a whole lot of trouble, baby. In this world, there's a whole lot of pain. In this world, there's a whole lot of trouble, but there's a whole lot of ground to gain. And why take when you can be giving? Why watch as the world goes by? It's a long enough life to be living. Why walk when you can fly? Number nine, giraffes are the tallest animal on the planet. We, you, we, like them, rise above the fray. We see the forest through the trees. And we take the long view of history, knowing that the arc of the moral universe is very long, but that it always bends towards justice. And we, the behavioral health sector, confront every single injustice with peace, with purpose, and with passion. Number eight, stamina. Giraffes can live for long durations without water. I actually need a glass of water. How ironic. But nothing describes our sector better than this. How long have we had to go without that foundation grant? How long have we had to wait for the state to pay its bills? Right? How long have we had to endure cuts in human services while corporate tax loopholes just seem to keep going and going? But really, more importantly, how long have our clients had to go without food and water because they were living on the streets or living on subways, because their Medicaid benefits were cut off when they were in jail, or because their Social Security benefits had been pending for over two years, or because, as was the case in Illinois a couple of years ago, they lost their psychiatric medications because the state thought it was too expensive to pay for them only to find out it was much more expensive to pay for them. How long have we all had to go without water? Too long. Number seven, giraffes require very little sleep. In fact, they only require 30 minutes of sleep a night. Sound familiar? Anybody in this room? I know the National Council staff have been sleeping about 30 minutes the last couple nights. Our psychiatric ER assessment teams, 24-7, 365. Our supportive housing, 24-7, 365. Our crisis hotlines, 24-7, 365. Our commitment to each and every client, 24-7, 365. So polar vortexes, we've had three in Chicago in the last two years, and heat waves. Polar vortexes and heat waves are simply excuses for our staff and your staff to sleep less and to work more. Number six, peaceful but not voiceless. We give voice to those who often don't have a voice. People who have been silenced by fear of incarceration, deportation, 
loss of their children. People who have been silenced because they have been labeled by institutions and by other people as crazy, lazy, and stupid. We give them voice. But when we really do our jobs well, we don't give them voice. We make sure that they use their own voices, strong and loud and proud, and often against us. Number five, strength. The giraffe can kill a lion with one swift kick. Boom. Look at those legs. Yeah, nice legs. <laughs> one swift kick. Now, I am not advocating violence or uh, killing anyone or anything. I'm a vegan, mostly. Uh, so I kill grass and twigs and other stuff for food. And the giraffe is a vegan as well. I mean, how do you not love that? But sometimes the vegan needs to kick the lion lion right in the butt. <laughs> we need to kick the lion and kick and scream to make sure that funding for food stamps for housing, for health care, is increased and not decreased. We need to make sure that Medicaid expansion happens in red states and not just blue states. I'm talking to you, Governor of Florida, if you're watching this. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that jails and prisons in our states, which are currently the largest community mental health providers, are not but that you and we are, we need to kick the lion. Number four, giraffes nap and give birth standing up. Nothing describes our sector better than this. <laughs> we are the consummate multitaskers. We eat, we work, we nap, we give birth, repeat. Eat, work, nap, give birth, repeat. Number three, and one of my favorites, Giraffes have four stomachs, as do we, and nobody in this room knows that. Even the doctors don't know that. One stomach for everything that we need for the nourishment physically and emotionally to do the hard work that we do, and three more stomachs for everything that we have to stomach for those <laughs> who ostracize, stigmatize, and demonize our clients and our agencies. We have four stomachs and abs of steel. I don't. I don't do push-ups or sit-ups, but I know many people in this room do. Number two, long necks. Giraffes uh, love to stick out their necks, and they love to neck. Again, I feel this exemplifies our, our industry, our sector. Uh, we don't need to be popular. We often are not. We mostly are not. But we stick out our necks for any client that needs us, any client that needs us but we love to neck, horse around, giraffe around. Uh, it's really hard work, and that's what we need to do. I mean, we're in Disney World, for Christ's sake, <laughs> right? And finally, number one, huge hearts. Giraffe hearts are 24 pounds heavy. That's heavy, and they are two feet in length. I totally love this metaphor because I use the word love every single day at Thresholds. I say how much I love my staff, how much I love our clients, our board, our work, and our sector, uh, and our colleagues, uh, many of whom I know that are in this room today. Yes, we need huge brains uh, to solve really big and difficult problems, and we need a commitment to social justice, and we need a belief that we can change complex, difficult problems and systems. But what I believe we need above all else is love. Kindness and compassion, gentleness of spirit, loving kindness, love. So I want to thank you and honor you for your voices and for giving voice to others. I want to thank you and honor you for being strong and fierce and fast. I want to thank you and honor you for having great necks, for having big stomachs, strong stomachs, and, uh, and mostly for uh, having a huge, huge heart. So two of my heroes, absolute heroes, Martin Luther King Jr. and John Lennon, as they would say or sing, all you need is love and a revolution. 
And I would add more giraffes. So my plea to you is when you leave Disney World today or tomorrow, that you go home and you kick some lion butt because you are giraffes and that's what we do. Thank you. That's great, great. Okay, so this ends our TED Talk, but please join me in, in, in applauding the uh, presenters.